morning to everybody. We're going to start with a bang um, with this first panel talking about the big issue of defining Europe's place in the world um, after the US elections and uh, initiative digital and of course uh, facing enormous constraints uh, externally as well as internally in terms of ambitions. Uh, we're very fortunate to have on this panel today four speakers who themselves have shaped in no small way um, Europe's place in the world over the past decades. Um, each of them has played a key role at critical moments in the development both of uh, the EU's ambitions and also its capacities to achieve them. They all of them played a role in the establishment of the External Action Service, um, also in the establishment of ESPAS, uh, and the, both the institutional and the political ambitions of the EU in foreign foreign policy. Um, it's really vital to connect up what this panel will discuss with what will happen later today, talking about the US elections and especially the sustainable recovery. Uh, Europe's place in the world used to be measured uh, mainly in terms of uh, trade, GDP, um, sometimes a little bit um, uh, armed forces capacity and defence capabilities. But increasingly, Europe's place in the world is determined by other factors, which might not have been discussed in the first ESPAS conference uh, 10 years ago. Uh, particularly, uh, climate was seen as one, one set of environmental policies, among others. And digital was a, a really new area where the EU um, was only just developing um, issues like uh, on issues like data. These days, these issues are center stage. And OSEPI, at OSEPI in Brussels, uh, we've been doing research on how much they will reshape geopolitics and the EU's place in the world. For example, climate change um, can reshape relations between global north and south. And of course, a world in which the oil price no longer matters will be a very different one from that of today, which itself affects Europe's ambitions. Um, as well as, of course, the relationship between global north and south affecting the EU's own self-image. It's remarkable how domestic political developments uh, over issues like structural racism have led to a re-examining of the colonial past, and that also affects the way in which we think about our relationship with other parts of the world. Um, and of course, the Green Deal will have enormous effects practically on uh, trade, development and so many other policies. Um, it's remarkable also how much the language around uh, Europe's global ambitions has also changed um, in the past decade. Uh, we've moved from uh, talking about um, uh, issues like um, how can the EU uh, find a, a new relationship with Russia to new language about, of course, uh, famously um, uh, sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty in external uh, relations. Um, and of course, we talk a lot about transformation. I think about the way that Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the, of the Union address uh, this year talked about, this is our opportunity to make change happen by design, not by disaster or by diktat from others in the world. Different view on what is competition about. She talked about planetary fragility, about a human economy, and about Europe being a global advocate for fairness, which is a very different kind of ambition. And of course, we've also heard new language um, from Josette Borrell, the High Representative, this morning. Um, we have four people who will be able to talk also about the constraints, um, US ambitions under President Biden and his capacity to act on areas that he clearly, where he's clearly in tune with Europeans, for example, on climate, um, are very important. How far will he actually be able to live up to those ambitions? So I'll turn to the panellists without further ado. We're fortunate to have David O'Sullivan um, to kick off, who of course served as um, the EU's ambassador to the United States um, until 2019. So he was in, in the hot seat during the Trump administration. And prior to this, of course, he was uh, chief operating officer of the External Action Service um, after a distinguished career in the European Commission, ending both as secretary general and then director general for trade. So David, you wrote in the Irish Times after the US election, we should be under no illusion. Biden's victory needs to be the beginning of new willingness on the part of Europe to stand on our own two feet and to be a more equal partner of the US in addressing global challenging challenges. But what does standing on our own two feet mean these days? Is it about defense spending or uh, do the new global challenges require other capabilities to counter disinformation, to promote climate action, to defend rules-based governance um, of trade, for example. Over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, it's all of the above, frankly. Uh, I mean, I, I think 
we should not be too self-critical. Europe is already and has been, and you touched on this, uh, quite a, an important global actor. Uh, you mentioned trade, we could talk about aid, humanitarian assistance, we could talk about the regulatory agenda. I know Bradford's book about the Brussels effect, the extent to which Europe has managed to set much of the regulatory agenda. Enlargement, which was in itself uh, a very important uh, foreign policy and, and global issue. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I think there is a lot that's positive. I, I think what has to change, however, is that we did this very much in the context of an alliance with America, where we heavily relied upon the US to do some of the heavy lifting. And I, I, I want to be very clear, I am not advocating uh, downplaying the importance of the transatlantic alliance. I, I don't believe there is any uh, dichotomy between uh, the concept of uh, more strategic autonomy for Europe and a very close transatlantic relationship. Uh, and that goes into security and defense, where America will continue to be our most important partner. It goes into trade and investment. Uh, it goes into the values agenda, uh, the defense of the multilateral system, as you have said, uh, and it goes into dealing with, with China. Um, but I think what is important is that we have to understand what is happening in America. And the election of President, future President Biden uh, is, is good news on many of these fronts. Uh, he will rejoin the Paris climate deal. He will rejoin the WHO. He will come back to the table, we hope, on the, the JCPOA which was an important uh, European uh, uh, achievement. Uh, and I hope, I hope uh, he will in due course, I suspect it will not be top of his agenda, that he will take a, a much more constructive view about, about the WTO. So on all of this, I think there's a lot of positive and we should work with him. But I also think that we have to recognize that Trump, the personality of Trump may have been defeated, but his policies were not. The, the Republicans had a relatively good election. So the, the, the underlying structural change in America, which is basically a fatigue of a sense of America doing too much, uh, being taken advantage of by allies, that is, is something that's not going to go away. And President, future President Biden is going to have to work with that, including, unfortunately for him, probably a hostile Congress if, if the two elections in, in January in Georgia do not yield democratic victory and therefore the possibility of retaking the Senate. So that's the context. So I think we need to indicate to this new administration uh, a willingness to do more, to do more on defense. Uh, I think we need to try and sort out some of the trade tensions that are between us. I think we need to look at the digital agenda, which is clearly has the potential to be problematic, if not correctly managed. And we need to discuss how we could jointly uh, work on China, but in a in a rather more constructive and, and forward looking way than perhaps was the case with, with President Trump. So uh, I, I think that's my that's my main takeaway from where we are today. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, going to be a very challenging agenda. Um, and it's also one where the um, it, it's not just about the big ambitions, it's about the practicality of these all of these policies you've just been mentioning, um, how each of them plays out, and particularly the relationship with China. What does a constructive relationship look like? Um, because that's not just about the US willingness to engage, but also the Chinese willingness. So we'll um, just remind you to the audience that um, you can put your questions to the panelists via the Q&A in the chat um, and you should add your name, your affiliation and to whom your question is posed. It can be to the whole panel. Um, and there's also uh, a special little game that SBAS has prepared for you, which is um, if you go on to Slido, so sli.do and type in SBAS as the conference code, you will see um, uh, a very intriguing question on which um, Espas would like your one word reply. So the question is, what is the one word you associate with Europe's place in the world in 2030? So it's not just answers. Postcard, it's actually an answer in one world, word. And then uh, we'll have a have a look, look at the word club. Out that's created by this audience of 200 and something uh, later on. But first, Stefano, you know, Deputy Secretary General of the Service of the EU. Um, uh, 
Uh, he was uh, the PSC ambassador. First battle. So, um, it's different. No. Um, the uh, High Representative Burrell said in June of this year, we have to have strategic able to respond to a crisis own means, and we don't have these means. He added that this requires political will, but that the EU has only advanced through crises. So what exactly would Europe do with it if we got it? Over to you. The uh, new concept, uh, um, uh, elements of strategic autonomy have always been part of uh, uh, um, have always been part of our story, and um, um, it's uh, it's enough to think about uh, the euro uh, and uh, the projection of the Europe in the world or Galileo, um, our EU's global satellite navigation system. Um, or our trade policy instruments, um, or general data protection and uh, legislation. Um, this means that essentially we have always tried over time to uh, develop our own uh, um, uh, autonomy in terms of defending our interests and promoting uh, um, our values. Um, what we need to do now is to uh, bring this uh, idea of strategic autonomy to uh, a different level to um, um, and build on the foundations that uh, uh, we have been creating over time. Um, the first thing that we need to do is to uh, define our interests, which are the things that we want to, uh, uh, to defend. Uh, and at the same time, we need also to see which are the uh, missing links, which are the uh, vulnerabilities that we have, mapping the vulnerabilities, one of the work that, by the way, ESPAS is doing, I think, quite successfully, and then work on these missing links and trying to, uh, uh, to create the instruments that are necessary in order to uh, um, um, cover this, uh, these gaps. Um, one thing is important to say, and I think that David uh, um, was already mentioning this, there is no dichotomy. Uh, um, being strategically uh, autonomous does not mean uh, um, abandoning our traditional alliances, uh, um, like with one with the US, or um, um, leaving NATO and starting our own defense system. Um, or uh, abandoning our uh, economic model and becoming um, protectionists. N none of these things. On the contrary, it just means, again, uh, having a clear sense that the, uh, um, uh, when there is a crisis, we have the instruments to uh, uh, face this crisis. And I think that somehow the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic has been a sort of uh, um, accelerator of also of these processes because we have been we have been facing these problems and we have found ourselves exposed with things which were in principle like banal eh? like masks or um, um, uh, i don't know some medicines um, uh, paracetamol uh, things which were relatively uh, innocent but that were showing that we had a number of um, uh, of weaknesses so from uh, um, from that point of view, I think that the, uh, uh, for us, what is important at this stage is to uh, be aware of what is happening, is to be aware of the, the difficulties also that the, uh, uh, we have in the world. And again, uh, uh, what David was saying uh, um, is right in the sense that uh, the polarization in our societies is still there. It's not gone away. Um, and this is something in the polarization in, in, in the relationship at the uh, um, world level is still very much present. So if we want to uh, 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 work in this world and if we want to uh, defend our interests and assert our principles in this world, we need to uh, go beyond the, the soft power that uh, has been the uh, uh, main uh, uh, element of the uh, um, of the European power. We need to go beyond this. We have to improve our uh, toolbox. Um, and if we go to speak the language of power, this cannot be only sanctions. So we need to uh, have also the capabilities. And I would say the last word, the most important thing is the willingness to use these capabilities. 
and as uh, um, uh, Romano Prodi uh, told me once, our main problem is not China or Russia, it's unanimity. And, and some things haven't changed as we're heading towards the European Council today. Um, <laughs> these issues remain just as relevant. Um, I will come back later to the question of whether it would be a good idea to have QMB um, in external action. But uh, first of all, I'd like to, to come to Natalie Tocci. And by the way, everybody do um, have a look at the Slido. I think Espas are about to, to show you the, um, the just on the screen um, what it looks like. Um, just so you can see the login for the word cloud. But I'd like to um, invite Natalie um, to come in with her perspective as one of the key drafters of the um, uh, security strategy. And um, I think you are sometimes accused of being the inventor of the term strategic autonomy. Um, uh, and whether they, so they, they, let's see whether this uh, this ends up being your epitaph. Um, Natalie is the director of the Italian Institute for International Affairs and also an honorary professor at the University of Tübingen. And most critically, for those of us in Brussels, she's special advisor to EU High Representative and Vice President of the Commission, Josep Borrell. So in 2019, Natalie, you wrote um, that without the EU's active, creative and even stubborn commitment, multilateralism would perish. Um, now, the EU definitely still believes in multilateralism, and we can hope also that Joe Biden will renew the US commitment to it. But is anybody else out there listening, particularly the Chinese? Well, yes, indeed, uh, Heather. I mean, it's, it's, about, it's about the Chinese, it's about the Russians, it's about everyone else. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll come to the multilateralism piece of it, because I think it is, in a sense, you know, the other side of the coin, not only of a strengthened transatlantic relationship, um, but also of the debate about uh, about autonomy that, that we've just been having. I mean, let me perhaps sort of take a step back and um, give you my sense of, of, of where we are and a sense of sort of journey that we've come uh, on over the last few years. Uh, and in a sense, I think this is a story of a glass half full and a glass half empty. Um, in many respects, uh, if we kind of rewind back to where we were, you know, five, six years ago, let's say beginning in, in 2014, um, you know, this was a time in which the European Union internally really struggled to agree on pretty much anything. I mean, these were years in which we didn't make much headway in terms of Eurozone reform, certainly not in terms of migration. And hey, all of a sudden, security and defense became the sort of proverbial low hanging fruit, which is really quite paradoxical, given that uh, defense has always been the ugly duckling of European integration. Uh, and of course, there are a number of reasons why that was the case. You know, there was uh, crises in and around Europe. Uh, there was the Brexit referendum. Uh, there was uh, obviously the election of Donald Trump. So you basically had a, a set of different exogenous factors really coming together. Uh, and on, on, on the one hand, on the other hand, this inability to agree on pretty much anything internally, uh, and hence this momentum on, on the foreign policy front on, on security and defense. Now, I don't think we're there anymore. And this is where I come to my glass half full, glass half empty story. Uh, because I think internally, um, actually, and this is the glass half full, uh, internally, we've actually made quite significant progress over the last uh, nine months, you know. Now, it is true that had the union not confronted uh, in a sh joint uh, manner, the pandemic, it probably would have been a crisis to many. I mean, you simply couldn't afford it to, you know, well, not fail, but certainly not succeed on the Eurozone crisis, certainly fail on the so-called migration crisis and fail again over the pandemic. And I think this kind of recognition was there. Uh, and it certainly spurred uh, European leaders. I mean, let's see now if we manage to sort of uh, seal uh, the agreement uh, over uh, over next generation EU. I mean, I'm relatively optimistic that one way or another uh, it will it will indeed uh, happen. But what we see is basically that internally we really do get our act together. We're beginning to get our act together, not only in terms of pandemic response, but also, and this connects to some of the remarks, Heather, that you were making, uh, in ensuring that that recovery is not any old recovery, but it is a green and a digital one. And that's the sort of glass half full. Now, let me come to the glass half empty. Now, this commission uh, came in saying three things. 
it was saying green, it said digital, and it said geopolitical. And I'm not a big fan of the geopolitical term. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, far more uh, comfortable with, with, with global. And I think ultimately this was what, what was meant. Um, but let's be fair and, and frank, I think that third leg is kind of out of the picture at the moment. And one only needs to look at it uh, in terms of funding uh, to realize that although the overall pie has been increased quite significantly, the share of it devoted uh, to foreign policy and particular to the security and defense element of this has basically been halved. Uh, and this, you know, and I think for in many respects as a citizen, not as a foreign policy expert, as a citizen, I think, for, you know, for perhaps for good reasons, you know, there is this greater internal focus uh, because of the pandemic and a shift away from a security lens to a socioeconomic lens. So Natalie, the citizen understands it and perhaps even politically shares it. <laughs> Natalie, as the foreign policy uh, expert, uh, obviously cannot but note that this is essentially a sort of uh, um, not withering away, but certainly sort of, you know, shift of focus away from the foreign policy front. Uh, now, now, this brings me to the to the debate about strategic autonomy. You know, I think over the last five years, basically what's been happening is that uh, we indeed put the concept out there. Uh, I didn't invent it. I mean, it was kind of there hidden in the council conclusions of December 2013, uh, but no one really noticed it. And, and it is true that it was then picked up and elaborated in, in the global strategy. Um, so we talked about it, we uh, then talked about it some more, uh, and then we established a number of instruments, you know, we did PESCO, we did the MPCC, we did the European Defence Fund, um, we did the, uh, you know, the, the, the civilian compact, I mean, we did a number of instruments uh, and, and sort of funding mechanisms, I mean, not quite there yet, but this is, you know, what, what we did. And then one would have expected that the kind of action <laughs> would have started. Mm -hmm. But no, what we do is we talk about it some more and then we come up with more documents. So now we start working on a strategic compass. I mean, we've done strategies, sub strategies, implementation plans, compacts. I mean, you know, we've, we've done the full Monty and, and, and one kind of, you know, waits for that just do it moment that never really seems to, to come. And, and, and this kind of brings me to, I think, the, the, the risks, as well as obviously the opportunities uh, that come with the Biden administration in the United States. So, uh, you know, yes, obviously, you know, now the European Union has its partner of choice again when it comes to particularly the multilateral agenda, uh, which doesn't mean to say that we will always see eye to eye with the United States, but essentially we will be playing on the sort of same team uh, uh, when when it comes to uh, climate, when it comes to digital, when it comes you know, the sort of big transnational challenges of our age related to demography, to digital, to climate. Basically, the United States and Europe will be working at hand in hand again. Uh, and that is, you know, it, it, uh, uncontrovertibly basically good, uh, good news. Uh, likewise, good news that we will have a United States that recommits very uh, forcefully uh, and then sort of very unambiguously to European security. And another piece of great news that although I do not expect the United States to become massively re-involved in our neighborhood, uh, we will not be working at cross purposes with the United States in our neighborhood. And that's kind of already another good piece of news, you know, particularly if we think about uh, events, for instance, in the Western Balkans uh, over, uh, over the last uh, months. Uh, where, you know, the sort of damage done when the United States and the European Union do not work in a coordinated fashion, they're all too evident to see. So obviously all this is, is good news, but of course there is a piece of not bad news, and, and it's bad news, let me sort of be very clear about this, this has nothing to do with the United States, it's, it has everything to do with, with us, but if it is true that there has been this sort of sagging momentum uh, on the global agenda, uh, you know, on, on the security and defense front. Uh, if this then comes on top of a lowering the guard, U European lowering of the, of the guard, that is sort of the product of an illusion and the illusion of a United States that will simply rewind back to the 1990s and be there for us, meaning uh, be there 
in our place. Now, this is not what this is not the stuff of the transatlantic relationship in the 21st century. You know, I think, and here I'm echoing, you know, what, what Stefano said, what David said, and I'm sure what Pierre will probably say in a moment. It is clear that a, a sort of revamped trans transatlantic relationship and uh, European autonomy are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, and, you know, one final word on all this, let's be very clear on what autonomy means and what it does not mean. Autonomy does not mean autarky, it does not mean independence. Autonomy means autonomy. Uh, the ability of the self, auto, uh, to live by its laws, norms. And the laws in question are domestic, are European, are international, so obviously this is very much related to the question of you know the multilateral rules-based order it does not mean that europeans want or even have to act alone it does mean that europeans should have the capability uh, of acting with others or alone you name it uh, and, and and this is the most important point they must have the willingness to do this uh, because you know we we talk a lot particularly in the in, in the sort of defense front on the, the capabilities that we need. And that's absolutely true. Of course, we need to have more and we need to spend more and we need to spend better and we know what that story is. But for many of the crises in and around us, we actually already have the capabilities. You know, we could do a lot more in Libya. We could do a lot more in Belarus. We could have done a lot more in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's just that we don't want to do it. Huh? Uh, and, you know, by not doing it and by keeping assuming that someone else will do it for us, namely the United States, we keep on simply observing time and time again that the United States will not do it for us. And hey, what happens when the United States does not do it and we don't do it, others do. And we know who those others are. Uh, and certainly the way in which the, the others are acting is not particularly in line with what our interests or values are. And I'll stop there, Heather. Thank you very much. And we already have questions coming in on, on exactly these issues. What are the values that are driving all of this and what kind of multilateralism it would look like? So we'll come to those. But first, uh, Pierre Vimont, um, highly respected French diplomat, of course, who was the France's ambassador to the United States. Um, he uh, is, of course, a former ambassador of France to the European Union as well. And he was the first executive secretary general of the European External Action Service. So, in, uh, Pierre, um, in 2019, last year, you wrote an article uh, in which you said, Europe as a global player will come of age only when all EU countries have the conviction that sharing their sovereignty brings genuine added value. So, is this conviction about the benefits of sharing sovereignty, and indeed some of the benefits that Natalie was just talking about, is it spreading among member states now, or is it retreating? Uh, some of the member states have, of course, recently upped their game in holding um, decisions in the Foreign Affairs Council to ransom unilaterally. Um, could Joe Biden help with the argument for more unity among member states in supporting common positions? Do we need to look to the US for help also on that? Over to you. Um, thank you, Heather, uh, for your very good question and for inviting me. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, great friends in, in this panel. Um, let me try to answer your question as quickly as possible. Um, on the issue of added value and sharing sovereignty, to be very honest, I'm not sure we're there yet. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, and uh, the real issue, in, in my opinion, is, is the following. Uh, there is um, an added value that is seen by all member states with the European Union. It's about being a player, uh, uh, not being a player, but being mostly a player, uh, uh, playing a, a big role in humanitarian assistance, in economic reconstruction with uh, countries that are facing a crisis or, con or conflicts. Uh, but when it comes to uh, being a real player, as we're talking about now more and more, being a geopolitical uh, player in, in the world of today, I don't see it at, at the moment. Uh, why? Uh, because I think that a foreign policy in our institutional framework has always been the weak leg of uh, European integration so far. Uh, we see it uh, with trade, with agriculture, even today with digital or new tech. Uh, member states are ready to move in and to allow the, uh, the traditional pattern of the European integration process moving ahead. 
uh, with regard to foreign policy, uh, there has always been, um, or even more so, it, there is an increasing pattern among member states uh, to work on their own and not to be ready to uh, even to abide by the provisions of the treaties. Um, I'm quite struck by that. You were talking a few minutes ago, you were mentioning qualified majority voting. It's there already in the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, there is constructive abstention if, uh, if we wanted to overcome some of these um, hostages as you um, uh, cases as you as you were talking about even at, at at the core the core principle of the provisions of the treaty are about cooperation consultation how to work together and at the moment many member states if not all of them i'm not looking particularly at, at the usual suspects it seems to me that there is a lack of consultation more and more with member states taking their own initiatives and moving ahead and from there on my sense of the situation today one that is very worrisome in my opinion is that to some extent we're even backtracking let's go back to um, the Iranian nuclear deal. Um, um, very good example of how we have been able to work all together, three member states leading and the other ones following. And today with the new uh, US administration, here is a very good example of where the EU is in a unique position maybe of mediating, being the honest broker between the new US administration and, uh, and, and Iran. But this very good example has never been able, uh, we have never been able to renew it um, and, and, and to have another way, uh, another uh, um, uh, uh, way of using that template and moving ahead. Uh, look at Ukraine at the moment, uh, the uh, Normandy format has two member states working the best way possible and trying to move forward, but we have no presence of the EU institutions there, no uh, HRVP as we have in the um, Iranian uh, case, the EU 3 plus 3. Um, look at the Middle East peace process uh, where the European Union for many years was the one able to push forward new ideas, to be innovative, to be creative, it, we tend to forget that it was um, Javier Solana who launched the idea of the quartet in 2003, I think, if I remember well. Today, if you look at the Middle East peace process, we are profoundly divided among member states and we're not doing much there at the moment. So, so it seems to me that we have uh, to avoid any complacency and to admit at a moment when, as, um, as Natalie was saying, we're talking about strategic autonomy, playing a greater role in the world, we have to look at the um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, the fault lines, um, the shortcomings at the moment of what we're trying to do together. How to change that? It seems to me that we have to go back to basics uh, to some extent. And to do exactly what Natalie was saying, when we're talking about strategic autonomy, which for instance, it's a very good case where there are a lot of misgivings among member states, where they don't maybe agree altogether about what should be done. Let's try to be concrete. Um, let's try to move um, on very concrete cases to dispel some of these misunderstandings and try to move forward. But more than anything else, it seems to me that maybe where we are making some mistake is that when we're talking about a common foreign policy, we're just trying to imitate what member states are doing on their own. And um, you, the European Union is not a state, as we all know. It's a very cumbersome process, um, sounds more like a multilateral organization, and maybe lacks the kind of agility that you need when you're facing a major crisis. Europe is not very good at crisis management, we have to admit that. So maybe what we need to invent is a new brand of diplomacy, taking into account the many assets Europe has, you know, in trade and digital new tech, and avoid the kind of silos um, um, uh, process that we have at the moment, and how to bring all this together to give to Europe a kind of leverage that it is maybe missing at the moment, and therefore inventing its own brand of diplomacy, which will be different from what the uh, different member states do, and what will bring at the end this added value I was talking about. I think that would be interesting. 
it needs um, innovation, creativity, new ideas, but I think this is maybe what we need to do now. Been too long. I apologize, Heather. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you very much, Pierre, because what you've said actually knits together well um, what the other speakers have also been talking about, this new brand of diplomacy drawing on the EU's very deep and uh, and well-developed assets in trade, in digital, um, in climate, and bringing those into diplomacy. I mean, climate diplomacy is going to be one of the key challenges where we would hope that the EU could work with Joe Biden, but he's going to be constrained by not having control of the Senate and not being able to implement measures in the US. We will also be constrained on the EU side as uh, the political opposition um, will, as, as we see today on, on, on finding it so difficult to get um, the funds necessary for the climate transition through the European Council, that this can also be problematic on our side. So these are areas that clearly need a lot of work and the way in which um, the EU institutions can work together in bringing together the different competences and capabilities is going to be vital. So we'll now have a chance to discuss it. We have a number of interesting questions um, on multilateralism, um, on strategic autonomy by design, um, and also on potentially the role of um, the EU-UK relationship. I don't want to go into that too much today because it does tend to take over the debate, um, but uh, we might touch on it. Um, but before we move to discussion, um, I'll just invite now um, the ESPAS uh, facilitators to put up on the screen the results of the Slido question. So the question, as you may recall, is everyone's asked for one word to associate with Europe's place in the world in 2030. Well, here we have some great um, input for the speech writers. Um, but uh, the next speeches of uh, Borrell, von der Leyen, um, Charles Michel, and so on can be democracy, resilience, and leader. Leader is an interesting one. Um, uh, and then we've also got peace, solidarity, united. Multilateralism is there, along with uncertainty, very important one, green transition, um, and so on. So there are a lot of really interesting questions there. I think it would be good to maybe leave those up for a little bit so people can get a sense of it. We do, I should mention that in the sidelines, they're still there's weak and fragile and uneven, um, all of which can also be applied to aspects of EU foreign policy. So. Um, yeah, very interesting, interesting results. Not such a necessarily such a, um, uh, a united audience either. So I just like to come first of all to the there have been a number of questions about multilateralism, uh, about the values that underpin it, but also about um, what are the alternative versions of multilateralism? So there's, there's not necessarily a return to the status quo ante. Um, even if Joe Biden does bring the US back into everything from the WHO, uh, maybe a different attitude towards the WTO, let's see, um, and of course back to um, the Paris and, and the COP negotiations on, on climate. Um, but there are, there are various different kinds of it out there, and there will be more as uh, other actors, for example, China, but also some of the Southeast Asian nations, bring their own versions of multilateralism forward. Um, say what they want rather than the post-1945 multilateralism that was constructed principally by the United States and Europe. Where we were asked, um, or the audience is asking, what's the EU interest in these various alternative versions? What type of multilateralism should we be aiming for? What kind of values should it be anchored in? Um, and are there um, examples elsewhere in the world of multilateralism that the EU should be inspired by, for example, the recent RCEP agreement in Southeast Asia. So who would like to, to uh, come in on that? Uh, Natalie, go, please go ahead. Um, yes, Heather, I've been thinking about this sort of quite, quite a lot. And, and, and to me, I mean, I, I sort of go back to uh, another word, actually, another term in the global strategy that I'm, I'm particularly attached to, which is principle pragmatism. Uh, and, and to me, this is really the way in which I, I, I think about this multilateral, uh, multilateralism question. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, I think what we need to do is start from, you know, what is it that we're trying to achieve? You know, are we talking about climate change? Are we talking about digital? Are we talking about economic recovery? Uh, are we talking about democracy? Are we talking about non-proliferation? And there will be some of those topics where the values department is particularly strong. I mean, you know, anything that falls in the domain, obviously, of, uh, of, of, of democracy, sort of human rights, democracy, civil society, everything that falls in the domain 
uh, of, um, to an extent, I would say digital, uh, given the, the connection between digital democracy and security and the sort of rights versus security debate. Um, everything that to an extent falls in the Department of, of Migration, uh, that I think is where we really need to focus on that set of countries uh, you know, in, in Europe, in the United States, or in, 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 in the Americas, uh, in Africa and Asia, where there is a, a sort of strong basis uh, and strong convergence over, over values. Then there are other topics. Hmm? Uh, and, you know, I think that I would certainly put, you know, economic recovery, uh, to an extent climate change as well, obviously, uh, you know, it, it, there, there is a strong value component to it, but I would put climate change in that department uh, too energy transition uh, more broadly and, you know, arms control, non-proliferation, uh, where, you know, I think that on those issues, we should and, you know, we, we must reach out to those uh, countries with, with whom we do not uh, share much when it comes to values, you know. I don't, you know, obviously we cannot do very much uh, over arms control and non-proliferation without engaging Russia. You know, obviously, uh, there will be very limited steps being made uh, over climate change if we don't engage China. So to me, it's really a question of, you know, starting with what is it that we're trying to achieve? And then from there, figuring out which are the actors that we have to engage with uh, in order to achieve the goals. Thanks. I'd like to invite um, Stefano Sanino also to come in on, on this question of what kind of multilateralism, um, but also perhaps on um, another set of questions about strategic autonomy. Um, a couple of people are asking, um, what does, could it be strategic autonomy by design? Um, so, for example, involving co-creation of a sustainable future, including for fair trade. And there's a very pointed question about why do some member states have problems with the EU's concept of strategic autonomy, as the recent debate between France and Germany shows? Is it because they see a dichotomy, the one that you were saying uh, doesn't exist earlier, with the transatlantic partnership? Or have they just got the wrong perception of autonomy? Is it a term that can be applied in different contexts and um, they, they're not taking the one that they like the most? What's your, your view on that? And, and please feel free to come back to the multilateralism question too. An example of what we managed to achieve uh, under, let's say, our instrument, which was Atlanta, the, uh, the uh, mission against piracy in the uh, Indian Ocean. And I mean, Pierre, you were, you were there at the, at the time, but certainly this is a, one of the things where we have all our interests have uh, um, come together. There was an interest to defend the uh, trade, uh, the, um, our um, routes, um, and we decided to use our military assets and all our assets. So in a way, was was very successful, which means that when there is a willingness to do so, and um, Natalie was also saying this, when there is a willingness to do so, the instruments in principle are already there. But that's why I was saying we need to uh, be sure that the, uh, this will is there. On multilateralism, I mean, um, let me put it this way. Multilateralism is, to me, it's more a sort of working method in the sense that uh, what we have to do is to, uh, uh, when we have a problem, try to sit around the table and find a common solution to it. That's the, uh, um, uh, we can say that, uh, how to say, we uh, um, uh, set a number of norms or of rules, which is also possible, but then it is also true that this may evolve over time. I mean, there is no doubt that the multilateral that we used to know uh, at the, um, in the post-war uh, uh, period is not the one that we have today. Uh, um, um, China was a much weaker actor compared with today. Um, uh, um, at the time, it was not Russia, it was Soviet Union. Uh, there was a different kind of assertiveness. So I mean, this is also changed. So it's the methodology is important. And then, I mean, within this, you need to say there are areas where you can progressively build consensus. I don't know, I mean, I we think, for example, climate change is an area where hopefully, uh, slowly, uh, we are converging towards a certain agreement at international, uh, at multilateral level. Um, and there are areas on which we will disagree because, I mean, the values are different and the way of approaching these things is different. And in that case, we need to try to work uh, how to minimize the impact and, um, of, um, of the differences. 
Um, on uh, uh, so that's the way I said. I don't know if there are alternative versions of multilateralism, but I mean, this is an evolving concept. It's not a fixed. It's not a picture. Let's say it's a movie. Concerning uh, um, the uh, autonomy, um, I I really believe that uh, there is no dichotomy. That there is no um, real problem between uh, uh, being autonomous and being a, um, a strategic partner with the, the U.S. Because at the end, the bottom line is that one. I mean, we see strategic autonomy as a way of moving away from NATO or moving away from the uh, our traditional relationship with uh, with the U.S. We need to be uh, uh, clear about that. There is a sort of ideological, uh, almost, let's say, theological position about the fact that uh, uh, we cannot do nothing to disturb, let's say, our relations with the United States. Uh, on this, I think that we need to be more uh, aware, and I would say also a little bit more bold. I mean, I, I, uh, um, I, mean, I don't know if the... Uh, the principal pragmatism uh, uh, coincides with this. I think it's a uh, um, adulthood somehow is something that is missing in foreign relations. We have a feeling that I mean uh, we have to uh, uh, stand on uh, uh, what we want, and there cannot be any way of let's say agreeing to disagree on a number of things, and that the. Uh, uh, and this is it. I mean, that's the, there is no way forward. How we manage with uh, uh, this kind of, of disagreement? Uh, I do not think that, I would say, the, 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 the disagreement with the United States uh, is uh, uh, fundamental. We have issues where we do not see eye to eye, for example, in trade. And I mean, we have instruments in order to uh, uh, be assertive in this area. And we are not shying away in using that. So, I mean, I do not understand why we should be shy in, in other sectors when uh, we see that there are disagreements in, uh, in some of our interests. Why we are divided on this? Because, I mean, there is one group of countries, I mean, not naming names, but there are a group of countries who are very, who, say, who believe that the relationship with the United States is key, essential, uh, is security, uh, um, is an uh, uh, existential point, and so they don't want to disturb it. There are others who are believing that, again, multilateralism, is a, in, um, uh, strategic autonomy, is a sort of protectionism by these guys, because we say that we want to protect more our uh, economy, the uh, uh, screening for foreign direct investments or the uh, request for a level playing field. So they are afraid that this can turn into a sort of renationalization or re-europeanization Europeanization of uh, um, of policies, and they uh, and I think that I'll say this kind of uh, difficulties needs to be uh, talked through uh, and uh, uh, discussed, and um, this problem can be overcome. I do not see any serious difficulty in finding a common understanding, a common position on on this point. And this is actually what is happening. You see, the debate is already there. Right? It's not the. Uh, it's not something. In, in 2013, it was hidden in some conclusions of the council, but nowadays we have op-eds written on this point every day. We are speaking openly about strategic autonomy. Um, um, France and Germany, uh, or at least some leaders in France and some leaders in Germany, <laughs> are discussing openly about these issues. So I mean, it's much better that we try to find a good understanding. And that we engage early with the new U.S. administration on this point, not to ask for their permissions, but just to make it clear that, let's say, it's in a common interest. And I go back to what uh, David was saying at the beginning and others that at the end of the day, this is the same, uh, uh, the same coin. It's on the other face of the same coin. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming to the end of our time in about six minutes, and we've got now a flood of questions. So I will uh, just give uh, um, uh, several of the most interesting to David O'Sullivan and to Pierre Vimont to um, think about which they would like to, to look at. So we have two that are specifically for them. So one for Pierre on could you give examples of how a new distinctive European brand of diplomacy could look like in practice? A specific one to David on of all of the things you mentioned that Europe should do, um, what are the realistic <laughs> possibilities 
exam question. Now, maybe you could do a kind of ranking between one to ten, um, but uh, given also given the views of other countries. Um, and then we have two broader ones that I think would be very good to try and answer if if, if it's possible. Um, one is about um, could we um, could you actually name three concrete deliverables that would for you mark a successfully revived. Uh, transatlantic relationship at the end of Biden's first term. You know, so just what are the three big things? Would it be, for example, uh, JPCOA? Uh, would it be a climate uh, pact at global level for some kind of some kind? What would be what would be your concrete deliverables? Um, and uh, um, and also a very interesting question about uh, about China and the US. Could the legacy of this pandemic be China as the new soft superpower? America is still the leading military power and Europe just not in the game. Um, but to, to relieve the pessimism of that question, um, there's also a question about um, could EU sustainability leadership and diplomacy include the global co-creation of convergence towards um, uh, well-being and lifestyles compatible with planetary boundaries? Could that be the EU's biggest foreign policy impact? So you've got quite a big um, set of things um, and I can only give you about two minutes each I'm sorry to say um, so I think pick ones which ones there I'm going to leave aside the UK EU because there's been a lot of discussion of that in other fora and the chance to talk about that also at SPAS later but I know you both have views on that so perhaps I could come to you first uh, David um, take your pick <laughs> thanks a lot Heather. Um, look Maybe to take the, you know, what, what, what do we need to do to rebuild the transatlantic relationship? Um, I, I mean, I've identified, I think, the four things that are potentially most problematic, uh, security and defense burden sharing, trade, um, the digital agenda and China. I mean, you know, I, I'm not excluding because I think the climate change and uh, multilateralism and JCPOA and all of that, they're also hugely important, don't get me wrong, the WHO and the pandemic. This is this, is this pandemic. We're going to face other pandemics. We desperately need greater global capabilities of addressing future pandemics, and that's something we need to do. But looking at it in terms of what are the issues that we have with the US, I would hope that within the next few years we could get to a better place uh, on the security and defense where there is a stronger sense in the in the us that yes the europeans are invested in doing something in this area uh, and that this in part uh, goes through more european uh, uh, capabilities and not just uh, lashing out tons of money on american kit i would hope that on trade we could take some of the um tension out of the, the irritants that are there, Airbus, Boeing, uh, we could do something. I, I, people get very angry when I say this, but we need to do something on agriculture. I'm not talking about TTIP, I'm not talking about massive beef quotas, but we need to do something that enables Biden to say, hey, I'm working with the Europeans and look, I've delivered some outcome for the agricultural lobby because that's important. On the digital stuff, I think we really need to try and sort out this digital sales tax through the OECD, if at all possible. Uh, we need to talk about uh, um, um, regulating the, the platforms. Yeah. And on China, I, I think the key thing is that we get engaged in a discussion, but which is looking at the two things which are needed. On the one hand, pushback against China on what we don't like, whether that is their economic policy or whether that is their human rights policy or their, their, their activities in the region, but at the same time engages with them in a constructive discussion about important things where they can contribute. Uh, climate change, uh, uh, the Iran deal, and, and other, other issues. We, we need to avoid this concept of, of a new Cold War uh, with China, uh, which, you know, and this concept of decoupling, which is a, a massive strategic error uh, if the West were to pursue that. So that's, for me, the kind of agenda on which I'd like us to see progress. And I believe it's important we do so because I would not like to predict the outcome of the 2024 election. And I think this is a, a window of opportunity in the next uh, two or three years to, to get the transatlantic uh, relationship back on a track in a way that it could withstand a maybe a slightly less pro-European president in the future. Thank you very much for that reminder, David, of, of how little time there in fact is. I remember uh, Robert Cooper, um, famous EU diplomat, saying, you know, 90% of foreign policy ends in failure. 
And the 10% of success depends almost entirely on timing. So uh, you're right, 2020 to 2024, this is the key moment. So Pierre, would you like to give us uh, your closing thoughts on all of these interesting questions? Please feel free to pick up what you think is most relevant. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I will, but maybe I, I will go through uh, once again the whole issue of multilateralism because I think it's a very good example about a new brand of, of EU uh, diplomacy. Um, I think Europe is, is facing at the moment a, a sort of double pressure uh, on, on with regard to multilateralism. One is internal, the other one is external. The internal one is that our middle classes all around Europe are fed up with the globalization. They have suffered from it, social inequality, so on and so forth. And what we have seen with Brexit, with the yellow jackets in France, um, maybe also some of the um, liberal movements we're witnessing in some of the member states, all this boils down to the same idea that we have gone too far and that we need to reinvent to some extent multilateralism in trade and, and many other issues. Um, the other one is external. Um, we're facing, I think, once again, the risk of uh, navel gazing. And we're not witnessing and observing what is going on in most of the, uh, I would say, the outside world, outside of the Western alliance, um, namely Asia, but other parts also, uh, Latin America and Africa. They're looking at Europe and at America as two places which are slowly crumbling down. I'm putting it in a dramatic way, but this is what they're witnessing. We're not very good at managing the pandemic, uh, contrary to many Asian countries. We're facing a huge economic problem in the years ahead, which is not the case in many of the Asian countries. Um, uh, lastly, um, uh, we are... Um, at the moment having problems uh, inside our own organization. Uh, uh, the American society is being profoundly divided, European countries are being divided, the Brexit phenomenon has gone through uh, everywhere in Asia as, uh, as an example of the vulnerabilities of Europe today. Uh, and with all this in front of us, the problem is how do we re-engage with Asia? How do we re-engage with our middle classes inside our own country? It is by reinventing a new brand of multilateralism precisely. And this is something Europe can do. I'm not thinking all that much about the UN Security Council. I'm thinking more about the UN agencies in Geneva, WHO, W Trade Organization, uh, etc., where Europe can speak with one voice and be a major partner in revisiting and reforming all of this. Maybe, by the way, this will be a major difference with uh, the United States, which may not have exactly the same view. But this is where, at the end of the day, strategic autonomy is all about. It's about Europe being able to invent its own ideas and its own ideas of reform, because uh, they are in line with our own interests. Um, so I'll stop there. There would be much more to say, but I'll, I think we don't have time. Mm -hmm. Indeed, there's a great deal more to say, but we, we're out of time now and uh, we need to give um, the floor to the next panel. But thank you to everybody who's asked questions and my apologies to those whose questions I couldn't uh, squeeze in. They didn't come up early enough on the feed or it just wasn't the time to bring them in. Thank you very much to our four speakers who've given us plenty of interesting food for thought and indeed a very interesting mixture of glass half full and glass half empty. Um, evidently the, the challenges are there and all four of you have seen how many challenges have gotten bigger over the past 10 years rather than smaller and yet all of you came up with constructive things that the EU can do in the future and very clear roles where the EU can make a big difference to the future of the world. So thank you for, for giving us those very interesting thoughts. And um, I'll now um, hand over the floor back to Esfas for the next panel on how can foresight offer a foretaste of the future? Thank you all. <laughs>